Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on this MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. Uh, so far we had looked at some mathematical prerequisites necessary for the course namely the probability theory and its basics along with the first and second moments namely the expectation and the variance and we talked about linear regression and in particular we discussed about two uh, different distributions one in discrete time and one is continuous time that will eventually be used when you talk about the asset pricing model. In this class, we will start talking about the financial aspect of the course and uh, we will talk today about financial markets where we will emphasize on three uh, specific things namely the different types of markets. This will be followed by a discussion on the different kinds of financial instruments and then we will essentially look at the different kinds of traders. And please note that this discussion will essentially be uh, focused on uh, the financial derivative markets which I will explain in a little more detail. So let us start this lecture. Uh, so the emphasis of this lecture uh, as I said just now this is going to be on financial markets. And in particular we will look at three aspects of financial markets namely uh, the types of markets and uh, we will then talk about uh, types of instruments and finally uh, we will talk about the types of traders. Uh, so to sum this up I mean the, we write that we focus on as I pointed out the types of markets, uh, instruments and traders and uh, we will do this discussion mainly from the point of view of financial derivatives. Uh, so this is important to emphasize on this. And what are financial derivatives? So these are financial instruments whose value is derived from the values of other more basic underlying variables. Uh, so this essentially means that uh, uh, the word uh, derivative here is from the point of view uh, of the fact that uh, the value of a financial derivative derives its value uh, from some more basic underlying asset. So for example, you could have an asset and on that asset you define a derivative. So the valuation of the derivative will move uh, dependent on how the value of the underlying asset moves. And so consequently we say that the value of the derivative is quote unquote derived from the value of the basic underlying asset. So now let us start off with uh, types of markets. So in this case in the context of this discussion, so we will talk about th that there are two kinds of uh, markets 
and uh, this is a very broad classification. So, namely exchange traded markets and over the counter markets. So, let us first talk about uh, what is an exchange traded market. So, remember that our discussion is in the context of derivatives. So, uh, we will we'll say that a derivative exchange is a market where standardized contracts that have been defined by the exchange are traded. So, uh, basically in, in an exchange traded market uh, any derivative that is traded on such a market uh, the terms and conditions of such a derivative is basically specified by the exchange and is binding on both the parties who actually go ahead with this uh, transaction of this derivative under the supervision of the exchange. So, then uh, two of the early derivative exchanges are One uh, is the Chicago Board of Trade or CBOT, uh, which was established in eighteen forty eight, and secondly, uh, the Chicago mercantile exchange uh, CME which was established uh, as a rival to CBOT in 1919. And uh, both uh, CBOT and uh, CME uh, mostly dealt with a future stripe contract and uh, we will ex uh, explain this in detail uh, when I talk about the, uh, the various types of financial instruments in the next section. Now, uh, once the uh, black scholes merton framework came in 1973 for which they won the Nobel Prize, the options market got a very big boom because it was for the first time that a mathematically justifiable way of pricing of options were introduced which gave a far greater confidence to the market when it comes to pricing of options and this gave a great thrust to the development and very fast and rapid expansion of the options market. So, accordingly the another market exchange came up and this was the uh, Chicago Board Options Exchange or CBOE and this was established uh, soon after the Black Scholes paper came out in 73. So, this was established in 1973 and they essentially started trading call options initially. So, again when I talk about options uh, at that point I will discuss in a lot more detail uh, as to exactly what uh, uh, a call option is. Okay, now, I want to make a, a note about uh, exchanges. Uh, so, uh, our typical impression of an exchange is that uh, you have a lot of traders on the floor of the exchange and uh, they trade 
uh, through a set of complicated hand signals. Uh, however, with the uh, evolution of uh, uh, the computer network, we have seen that there is a shifting of uh, this mechanism of functioning of exchanges uh, where instead of phys traders physically trading on the floor, slowly the trading process is being switched to the digital mode. So, accordingly we make the following note that the traditional And, and, and the uh, process of uh, the traders trading on the floor is what is known as the open out outcry system uh, which involves the traders uh, physically meeting on the floor of the exchange is being replaced by electronic trading system. All right. Uh, so, uh, these are the two main points that I had to discuss about uh, the exchange traded markets. And now I want to move on to uh, what are known as the over the counter markets. Or uh, this is what is known as OTC markets. Uh, so, uh, over the counter markets uh, these are an uh, important alternative to exchanges and uh, is more importantly much larger in terms of the total volume of trading as compared to the exchange traded markets. Uh, and now, as uh, this over the counter market, the modus operandi of this is that the trading for OTCs, OTC markets is carried out over telephone and computer linked network and it typically takes place so, uh, any trading on an OTC market typically takes place between two financial uh, institutions or between a financial institution and one of its clients and the client could be uh, such as a fund manager or say a corporate treasurer. Uh, so, here I want to emphasize a couple of things. See, uh, the exchange traders markets uh, is uh, open to small investors. However, as I have noted, the over the counter markets uh, is uh, just a place where large financial institutions trade among themselves or a financial institution trades with one of its uh, larger clients in terms of net worth. So, the advantage of an exchange traded market is that uh, the exchange specifies the rules and acts as an intermediary. So, this means that there is a far greater safeguards for the both the parties that are involved in trading in the exchange market. 
However, the disadvantage of this is that because the contracts are standardized, so it offers little very little flexibility in terms of how the contracts are designed. On the other hand, the advantage of the exchange traded markets becomes the disadvantage of the over the counter market and vice versa. So, this means that because uh, there is a greater protection in the exchange traded market, it offers less flexibility. However, since the over the counter markets, they are uh, a place where individualized contracts can be negotiated, they are far more flexible. However, because they are over the counter markets, and that means that there is an absence of an intermediary in the form of the exchange. That means that there is far lesser protection uh, that is offered by exchange as in, in case of the OTC market. So, OTC markets are more flexible, but offers lesser protection to both the parties. Whereas, the exchange traded market, even though they are less flexible, they offer far greater financial protection to both the parties that are involved because of the presence of the exchange as an intermediary. Okay, so, this concludes our discussion about the markets. So, next we move on to financial instruments or types of instruments. And uh, we consider three types of instruments. And by this I, I mean uh, financial instruments or derivatives. So, the first one that you will consider is what is a, a forward and futures. So, we begin with talking about what is a forward contract. So, a forward contract is an agreement to buy or sell an asset at a predetermined future time for a pre determined price. And uh, another characteristic of a forward contract is that it is traded in over the counter market, uh, usually between two financial institutions or uh, between a financial institution and one of its client. Uh, further, a forward contract is legally binding on both the parties. Okay, uh, so, when I say that the uh, I use the statement that the forward agreement is legally binding on all both the parties, it means that whenever both the parties get into a forward contract that uh, one party is going to buy the asset and the other buy is uh, going to sell the asset and uh, the time at which the purchase and sale will take place it is a future time and some uh, price is fixed, but the future time and the price at which this transaction will take place is decided at the present time point. And so, this means that when I say that it is a legally binding contract, it means that both the parties are legally obliged to fulfill their commitment. So, that means the party which has agreed to buy has to buy and the party which agree has agreed to sell has to sell the underlying asset and then there is no possibility of any default at least from the legal point of view. Now, at this point it might not be very clear as to why this is an important statement, but once we talk about options, we will see that options are similar to forwards and futures except that 
the options are legally binding on only one of the two parties which is the main feature that distinguishes options from forwards and futures. So, coming back to forwards as I said there are two parties and there is an agreement to buy an underlying asset for a pre-specified price. So, at this point we will introduce two more terminologies to identify the party which buys the asset and the party which agrees to sell the asset and receive money for it in lieu. So, the party in the forward contract which agrees to buy the asset is said to have the long position and the party which agrees to sell the asset is said to have the short position. Uh, now, forward contracts, one place where forward contracts uh, are popular is that forward contracts on foreign exchange is a popular way of hedging against foreign currency. exposure. So, uh, let us now move on to what is the futures contract, I will come back to the issue of payoff later on. So, uh, for futures contract, so the futures contract is uh, very similar to a forward contract with the only distinction being that uh, it is traded on exchanges. So, unlike a forward contract. A futures contract is an agreement between two parties to buy or sell an asset at a future pre determined time for a pre determined price, but it is traded on an exchange. Uh, so, I should actually say this, uh, this should be like. So, just to wind it up, so basically like a forward contract, a futures contract is an agreement to buy or sell the underlying asset uh, at a future predetermined time for a future predetermined price, uh, but it is traded on an exchange. So, it is in principle it is the same as the forward contract with the only distinction being is that the forward contract is over the counter while this is an exchange traded derivative. Uh, now, since there is an exchange involved, so obviously as I said that there is a mechanism to ensure that neither of the party defaults and both the parties they are protected. So, accordingly now I can make the statement that the exchange specifies a standardized uh, futures contract. and provides for a mechanism uh, and this mechanism is known as marking to market to ensure that 
this legally binding contract, so like forward this is a legally binding contract is honored by both the parties in the contract. Uh, so, let me just wind up uh, with one last observation that is regarding the payoff. So, in this case suppose that I have some time t equal to 0 at which I get into a, a forward or a futures agreement and uh, suppose the price of the underlying asset at time t equal to 0 is denoted as S of 0. Now, suppose that the price that we agree, so we agree that the asset S will be sold at time t equal to capital T for some price k and suppose that at that time the price of the asset in the market which is known as the spot price is S of t. Then the payoff for long position is going to be given by this. So, payoff for the long position is going to be the following that uh, so please observe that the party which has agreed to buy the underlying asset at time t equal to capital T they are going to sell the uh, they are going to pay an amount of k and buy the asset. So, that means an amount of k is spent by them. So, I write minus k and then they can immediately sell it in the market in which case they will receive an amount of s of t minus k. So, essentially is the difference between, so another way of looking at it is basically is the difference between the price that the party with the long position would have paid at time t equal to capital T if they had not got into the contract with the price that they are paying because they got into the forward or futures contract. So, if S of t is greater than k, obviously the party with the long position tends to gain because again an amount of S t minus k because they are paying price k for an underlying asset which otherwise would have caused them S of t at time t equal to capital T. And on the other hand, if S of t is less than k, then they end up paying a higher amount of k as compared to the prevailing market price S of t and which means that they have basically incurred a loss. From this, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, counterparty point of view, that means from the point of view of the short position, the payoff is going to be, so payoff for short position, this is going to be nothing my but k minus s of t. So, this means that they are receiving an amount of k and minus S t is the amount. So, suppose that the party uh, they uh, they were they were holding on to the asset. If they had sold the asset in the market, they would have received an amount of S of t. However, instead of that they will have to uh, sell this asset for a price of k because they have already got into a forward or a futures contract which is legally binding. So, that means that their gain or loss will be given by k minus s of t that is the difference between the for price at which they agree to sell uh, under the forward or futures agreement and the price they would have got had they not got into this agreement. And you notice that the sum of these two this is going to be equal to 0. So, this is what is known as the zero sum game. So, whatever is the gain of the party with the long position becomes the loss of the party with the short position and vice versa. So, if S of t minus k is positive that means the long position party they gain an amount S t minus k which is same as the loss of the party with the short position and if the party with the short position has a positive gain then that gain is the same as the a loss of the party with the long position and these are what are known as the payoffs for the long and the short position respectively. Okay, so, this concludes our discussion on forwards and futures and the next thing that we move on is what is known as options. Uh, so, options are uh, one of the most mathematically well studied uh, financial derivatives. So, these are so, uh, so options are derivatives Uh, which are traded both in 
over the counter markets as well as exchanges. Uh, so, before I move on to uh, the specifics of options, what I want to point out here is that uh, while forwards and futures was a legally binding contract on both the parties, uh, uh, options are actually legally binding on only one party. Now, both forwards, futures and options are an agreement to buy or sell the underlying asset for a pre-specified price at a future pre-specified time. However, in case of forwards and futures, both the parties have the obligation to honor the contract. However, the options are designed in a way that only one party which, uh, which, has, there is, which has the obligation and the other party has the, uh, does not have that obligation. So, what actually happens is that there, the party which has the obligation that is in a weaker position as compared to the party which does not have the obligation. And so, consequently what happens is that the party which does not have the obligation is in a position of leverage over the party which has the obligation for which the party with the obligation being in a weaker position will demand an upfront amount to be paid at time t equal to 0 from the party which is in advantageous position which is known as the price of the option which is a very very important area in mathematical finance. Now, in order to now when I talk about the uh, purchase or sale of an underlying asset under options where one party has the obligation and the other has the right to sell the asset, it immediately brings us to two different ways in which this can happen. In one case, the one of the two parties of the option agreement will have the right to buy the underlying asset, but not the obligation. And the other possibility is that the one of the two parties will have the right to sell the asset, but not the obligation. So, accordingly this brings us to the basic classification of options namely call and put options. So, accordingly we start off with the call options. So, the first one uh, let us talk about call option. So, this gives the holder of the option that means the party with the position of advantage. So, holder of the option the right but not the obligation to buy the underlying asset on or before a future predetermined date. So, please see that we now allow for this purchase to happen before a future predetermined date for a pre specified price. Okay. Uh, so, let us look at this uh, payoff. So, in this case the payoff will be given by maximum of S t minus k comma 0. So, the reason for this is the following that the party which has the right to purchase but not the obligation. So, when they so if S of t is greater than k then obviously, the party which has the right to buy the asset is going to buy the asset for a price of k and then sell it in the market thereby making a profit of s t minus k. However, if s of t, so this can be equal to sign and if s t is less than k, this means that the party which has the right to buy will not exercise or execute that right. The reason being that if they execute the right, they have to pay a higher price of k while they have they can always purchase the particular asset for a lower price at the prevailing market pr lower price of s of t. So, it does not make sense for them to buy the asset for a price of k which is higher than the prevailing market price at time t equal to capital T. So, in this case basically they will get an amount of 0 because no transaction actually takes place. So, this gives us that either you receive an amount of s t minus k 
or you receive an amount of 0 and so this means that you basically get the maximum of st minus k comma 0. And this is from the point of view of the party which purchases the option or which agrees to uh, buy the, so which basically retains the right to buy the asset but not the obligation to buy it and consequently your payoff is going to be given by this. Recall that in case of the uh, of a forwards or futures, we had S of t minus k. So, here there is no possibility of you having a payoff that is going to be uh, negative. It is either going to be 0 or it is going to be positive, but the payoff for the long position in case of the uh, forward or a futures, it can become negative. So, there is a possibility that you will actually incur losses. So, this means that one of the parties in the in the call option that the party which is the right under no circumstance are they going to make a loss which causes a disadvantage to the other party and this is the reason why this party which has this non, a non negative payoff that party has to make an upfront payment of premium to the party which has the obligation, in this case the party which agrees to sell the underlying asset for a price of k, uh, an amount and that amount is what is known as the price of the option that I had mentioned earlier. Okay, now, let us uh, talk a little bit about uh, put option. Uh, so, here uh, this gives the holder of the option. the right but not the obligation to sell the underlying asset on or before a future predetermined date for a pre-specified price. And in this case, the payoff is going to be maximum of k minus st comma 0. Okay, so, so to wind up the discussion uh, on uh, the options, I will just quickly uh, describe some uh, terminologies. So, the future predetermined date is called the expiration date or maturity. And the pre specified price is called the exercise price or the strike price. And uh, finally, uh, I want to make an observation that European options can only be exercised at maturity, but American options can be exercised and at any time on or before the maturity. Uh, so, here I want to uh, identify three things which has led me to uh, make these three uh, observations. See, I said that it is an agreement uh, where there one party has the right and the other has the obligation to buy or sell the asset on or before a future predetermined date at a future uh, at a uh, predetermined future time. So, there are three things one of them is that there is a, a future time and one is that there is a, a, a 
P specified price. And finally, uh, once I have talked about a future uh, pre specified future time, then I have said that you can do the exercise at any time on or before that future pre specified time. So, first what I talked about is that I talked about uh, this uh, uh, future predetermined date which and we call this as the expiration date or maturity and the future pre specified price we call it the exercise price or the strike price. And I have said that uh, the option can be executed or the transaction can happen any, any time on or before this future date which I call the expiration date or maturity. If the contract is such that the purchase or sale of the underlying asset can take place only at the maturity and not any time before it, then we call it as a European option. But on the other hand, if the option has the flexibility that it can be exercised and the, uh, and the purchase and sell can take place at any point either at expiration or, mat and mat or slash maturity or any time before it, such kind of more flexible options are what are known as the American options. So, uh, that way you can see that we have seen that there are two broad classifications of options. One is the call and the put where the holder has the right to buy uh, uh, and or the right to sell respectively. And then whether the execution can take place uh, only at maturity or it has the flexibility of any time on or before the maturity results in what are known as European and American options respectively. So, this gives us a four, four co combinations namely European call, European put as well as American call and American put. So, when come to the last of the three derivatives that we wanted to talk about and the third one uh, derivative that we will talk about is what are known as swaps. So, here uh, what are swaps? So, it is again it is an agreement between two parties to exchange cash flows in the future. And uh, this agreement defines the dates on which the cash flows are to be paid and the way they are calculated. So, uh, typically swaps are used in case of interest rate. So, let me explain what do I mean by exchange of future cash flows. Suppose uh, you decide to take a home loan and you know that the home loan has a floating interest rate. That means, if you start today with say 12 percent interest rate, a year from now the interest rate might be different. Maybe it will become 13 percent or 11 percent for example. Now, you, are, you have taken the loan from say a bank A and you are not comfortable with the idea that your interest rates keeps floating or fluctuating and so there, there is a certain amount of uncertainty. So, what you do is that you go to bank B and the bank B agrees uh, to your proposal and says that all right, what we will do is that we will uh, pay the floating interest rate to bank A and in, in lieu of it, you basically give us a flat, flat interest rate say of 14 percent. So, this means that instead of paying a, float, a, flat, a floating rate to bank A, uh, or, or a continuously shifting rate to bank A, you are paying an, a fixed interest rate to bank B and bank B in turn takes care of the floating interest rate which it pays to bank A. So, what you have done essentially is that you have exchanged the cash flows. So, instead of paying to, uh, to bank A, you are now paying this to bank B. So, what you have done is that you have basically swapped your interest payments 
uh, from bank A to bank B with bank B taking care of your interest rate payments to bank A. Okay, so, this concludes our discussion on derivatives. So, finally, we come to the last topic for this class and that is on different types of traders. Uh, so, there are broadly uh, three types of traders. So, the first one are what are known as hedgers. So, uh, hedgers use derivatives such as forwards, futures, options and swaps to reduce risk arising from potential future movements in a market variable. The second one is what are known as speculators. So, uh, speculators use derivatives to bet on the future direction of a market variable. And finally, we have something called arbitragers. So, arbitragers take offsetting positions in two or more instruments to lock in a profit. So, let me explain this in little more detail. Who are the hedgers? So, the hedgers use derivatives to reduce risk. So, hedgers are essentially risk managers who will use these derivatives to uh, hedge against or take uh, uh, preventive measures against uh, unfavorable movement in case of uh, the uh, movements of the underlying asset. Uh, so, a simple example could be that a hedger could buy a futures to lock in the price of a certain underlying asset at a future time point. So, uh, uh, an example for this is the, the as I said is the foreign exchange rate. So, a company which is expects to receive some foreign exchange at say 6 months down the line is worried about that the exchange rate might move in an unfavorable direction to them. So, they get into a futures agreement uh, with a bank or a forward agreement with a bank under which the bank agrees to uh, pay them a fixed exchange rate decided at time t equal to 0. So, that way they have basically hedged or protected themselves in the sense that they know certainly sitting at time t equal to 0 how much is going to be the foreign exchange rate that they will receive at the future time point of 6 months. Speculators on the other hand they are people who are willing to take risk and they basically go and speculate uh, about the direction in which a particular asset or the market will move and accordingly. Uh, they take up the positions to reflect their speculative opinions. And finally, arbitragers are people who basically take advantage of the price difference between two financial instruments or two, more than two financial instruments. So, what they do is that they are always looking for two financial instruments in the market which are underpriced and they buy it and then they basically sell it in another place for a higher price. So, effectively to sum it up arbitragers are nothing but individuals who are on the lookout for a price mismatch and taking advantage of, of them. So, an example of this is that there could be two markets A and B where an asset in market A is selling for 20 and that in market B is selling for 30. So, they can buy from, uh, from one place at 20 uh, and then sell it in the other place for 30 thereby profiting, um, uh, pocketing a profit of 10. 
However, arbitrage opportunities do not last for long because once the market notices this price mismatch, then an automatic mechanism will ensure that the prices eventually match and the market will correct itself. Uh, so, finally, what I want to do is I want to uh, do a broader classification and this will act also as a prelude for my next lecture. So, this classification will be of securities and contracts. So, we have basically discussed the contract part of it today. So, contracts they can be, so the contracts I includes basically derivatives and other contracts. And we have looked at three types of this, we have looked at options, forwards and futures and swaps which we have already discussed in today's class. But we are here to discuss on securities, so we will basically look at the two basic securities. One of the basic securities is the uh, what is known as the fixed income securities. And the most common example of this is bonds, which we will discuss in the next class. And the other one is equities. And the most common example of uh, equities are stocks. So, bonds and stocks are something that we will discuss in the next class. So, just to sum it up, uh, what have we done today? We have basically looked at financial markets uh, with an emphasis on uh, derivatives market. And we identify the three components of this markets. First of all, one is the kind of market where you talked about exchange traded and uh, over the counter markets and what are the advantages and disadvantages with these two markets. Next, we talked about financial derivatives and we talked about the three most important financial derivatives, namely forwards, futures, options and swaps. And finally, we briefly outlined on uh, what are the different types of traders, namely hedgers, speculators and arbitragers. And then we looked at a broad classification of uh, securities and contracts and contracts are something that we have discussed in detail, detail in the next class. And the securities part we will discuss in the next class with a particular emphasis on the basic securities, namely uh, the fixed income securities and equities, the two examples of which are bonds and stocks respectively. Thank you for watching.